Welcome to this uh, uh, podcast hosted by the Middle East Center at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. My name is Faisal Devji, and today I will be speaking about a book by Aaron Tukendaft called The Idols of ISIS, um, From Assyria to the Internet. Uh, and I will be joined uh, by the author uh, who teaches at Bard College Berlin, as well as by Joshua Craze, who is a writer an artist in residence at the Embassy of Foreign Artists in uh, Geneva. Uh, so welcome, Aaron and um, Joshua. Aaron, perhaps we can start off by having you say something about your book. Sure, and thank, thank you, Faisal, for, for having me here. So my book started off with an experience on February 26, 2015. I was at a lecture in New York at ISAW, the Institute for the Study of, of the Ancient World. Uh, it was a lecture being given by Zainab Bahrani, a wonderful historian, art historian at Columbia. She was talking about ancient Mesopotamian art and uh, artistic modernism. And at the end of the lecture, during the Q&A, somebody asked what should be done, that there was some type of disaster had happened and what, what did Zainab think should be done? And I was very confused. I didn't know what she was talking about. I'd actually been spending the whole day with some former students of mine from Munich who were visiting in uh, New York that day. And so as a result, I hadn't been on Facebook at all. And so therefore I didn't know what was going on in the world. And so I, walked over to the corner of the room and I looked on my phone and there it was on my feed, this video that uh, ISIS had posted onto the internet. Um, I saw it repeatedly, a video of people smashing sculptures in the museum in Mosul in Northern Iraq. And I saw it you know, over and over again, this video of um, smashing of antiquities in Mosul's museum. And after I got over the initial shock and anger of seeing a video like this, I noticed that one of the scenes in particular, which showed three men with sledgehammers smashing the sculpture of a king on the, on, uh, laying horizontally on the floor, resembled almost exactly, I mean, incredibly uh, this, this ancient Assyrian relief sculpture that I, that I knew of uh, from Sargon II's palace, which also showed three men with sledgehammers smashing the sculpture of a king. And this, this relief was from 2,500 years, was 2,500 years older than the video. And yet it showed the same thing and it was produced only 25 kilometers away also in no, uh, what's now Northern Iraq. And so that got me thinking about um, the relationship between these two images, this unca uncanny uh, resemblance, the nature of iconoclasm, smashing of images, why we do it, why we make images of that destruction. And suddenly I felt like I needed to write a book because here was a topic that brought together a whole bunch of the subjects that I had been studying for years, but most people thought were, were the result of the fact that I couldn't choose what to study. And so I had studied art history and political theory and history of religion um, and the seriology. And now suddenly all of these things converged in this video and I wanted to make sense of it. Um, so I embarked on, on this book. And if I may take one more minute just to, to share another sort of angle for myself, there's also a personal angle from the book. So my, my family on my mother's side uh, they come from Iraq. They're uh, Baghdadi Jews who had lived in Iraq probably as far back as the Babylonian exile. My grandfather was born uh, in Baghdad by the Tigris around 1910. We don't know exactly what year he was born. It was the nature of being born around that time. Um, and he grew up in this new country of Iraq, which was at the time an incredibly cosmopolitan place, very, very mixed with 
um, Jews and Muslims, Sunni and Shia and, and other minority groups. And it was, um, this was, this was the Iraq that he grew, this was the Iraq he grew up in, but at the same time, it was the Iraq that he had to flee after the Farhud, the pogrom against Jews in 1941, which then led him to leave first to Tehran and then to Tel Aviv, and then eventually to New York, which is where I was born. And so the other story of this book, right? So there's this one line, which is about iconoclasm. The other line is about uh, the nature of politics as the possibility of, of different people living together rather, uh, rather than the need for homogenization or this sort of ten, uh, tendency towards homogenization. And that tendency, of course, just continued. Uh, it didn't end with, with the, the Jews leaving uh, Iraq, but continued as a result of uh, separations between Sunni and Shia as, uh, in the aftermath of the US-led invasion. And then at the time of the, that I started the book, the events that were happening in Northern Iraq as a result of I ISIS's rampage through those areas, right? And the terrorizing of minority communities. And so this was the other issue that I wanted to think about um, how, why, why this tendency towards homogenization? How might we actually live pluralistic lives, right? What is, uh, and, and what is, and then bringing those two together, what is the role that images play in achieving some kind of life together? Uh, uh, thanks very much, Aaron. Uh, you know, I found it um, uh, fascinating uh, how you make this argument uh, about the image and the possibility of politics. Um, and I have a number of questions about that myself, but perhaps we can um, move to Joshua um, you, you, to start us off with this fascinating relationship that Aaron draws uh, between those two things. Thanks Faisal and thank you Aaron for your book. And I thought one of the really interesting things about it is it mounts this argument that says that not only is there is a destructive urge in ISIS destruction of like icons and iconism, but it's self-defeating. That there's a dream here, which is a world without images, in which you have this unmediated politics, which relates truth to the believer. And so look, every time there's a destruction of an image, what does that produce? It just produces more images. And within that sort of process in which there's simply sort of this, we're, we've, we're forced to live with the ambiguity of images and the uncertainty of images. You oppose towards the end of the book, the figure of destruction to this figure of tapping. And you use Nietzsche and you say, look, rather than trying to destroy images, we need to learn to live with them. And what I've been trying to do in this book, I'm paraphrasing Aaron, is to tap the images, to see the resonances between them. And I thought that was a really powerful image. And I wanted to both ask you a bit more about what tapping involves, but I also wanted to sort of give a provocation in a way, which is that what makes destruction not a form of tapping? Because actually one of the things I think you do really well in the book is you say, look, there's a real problem with our defense of heritage, right? With our attempt to sort of depoliticize images, depoliticize statues are in museums. These are, as you beautifully show, parts of very explicit political nationalist projects and have been since the inception of the museum. And the sort of defense that says we shouldn't destroy things because they're not political, they're part of some punitive humanity, that's not convincing. These images are always going to be political. And what sort of struck me relative to what ISIS was doing was a line from Walter Benjamin, where he says, the consecration of things can destroy them even more than destruction can. And what I take him to mean there is that there's something about what ISIS is doing which activates images and activates them as part of a political discussion such that we're now forced to pose the question, well, what is the, our relationship to Assyria, to a Mesopotamian heritage or putative humanity? And as you show, it's not like ISIS destruction has the final word, right? There are immediately, as you show, a series of artists who immediately take up that video footage that ISIS show, their images of their own iconoclasm, and make even further images. So I guess I entered the book thinking, so I finished this book knowing that Aaron is a tapper. He's someone who taps images to find their resonances, but actually isn't Isis and isn't the beginning of the book to come to the end of the book, you know, to come to the beginning of the book at the end, 
the person who tapped you or the group that tapped you such that enabled the writing of this book? So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that's, I mean, I think that that's very rich and I think we could, you know, we should be trying to nuance it, but I, you, your comment makes me uh, remember a comment that I make towards the end of the second chapter, which is this chapter on museums and this chapter on, uh, as, as you refer to, right, this chapter that makes us recognize that these objects in museums that we, that, that were called, that, that we like to call heritage and are embedded within a kind of binary between civilization and barbarism that I think needs very much to be tapped, that, that, that dichotomy. And I say, um, and here I'll just quote, nobody who has viewed the Mosul Museum video can experience ancient Mesopotamian sculpture in quite the same way again. If avant-garde art is meant to disrupt conventional ways of seeing the world, then the Islamic State's video is, quote, good work. And I think that that's to the point of what you're saying, right? I absolutely, I, I, I agree that if we take the video as a, as a kind of tapping, right? Um, then, I, I, and, and tapping the, the assumptions underlying museums and certain, and, 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 and all that museums can, can stand for, I think that that's very much the point. And I think the, to, to connect it though to the alternative between tapping and, and, and smashing then, right, would be, well, what is the, what is underlying the desire to achieve some kind of purity, right? And so, I mean, and I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant here because I, I wonder whether it's necessary to think about, think about this in terms of intention. Maybe we, we, can, we can talk about that, but, but at, if, if we do introduce the, the notion of intention, right? We could say, well, the, there's certainly, it's certainly the case that the video can perform a certain tapping function, right? That makes people think about uh, things differently and sees the limitations of things that they might have, might not have uh, uh, before. So I think that there, that is one part of the story. The other part of the story is um, the desire to escape that ambiguity. And in a sense here, I'm, I'm using ISIS as a, as a placeholder for what I take to be a much wider um, human tendency, a perennial human tendency to escape, uh, to escape the ambiguity of images, to escape the fact that, as I, as I say elsewhere, right, that if our politics requires images, right, and yet our images are necessarily partial, they necessarily only tell the ha a half of the truth, and they, they, therefore they, they are necessary, they, they have these false elements, and they're also, and, and that, and that they're also part of our uh, our production, right? The things that we have made. There's a desire to try and escape that, to, to, to put some, uh, some kind of veil or, or, or deny the, um, the fact that we, have, that we can do no better than to live in that state of um, uh, imperfection or ambiguity. And so the other thing that I'm tracking in the book, right? And that I'm using ISIS in a way as just a, a placeholder for is that impu Im impulse to break free of that human, what I take to be a human necessity. Like I, I, I don't believe we can break free of it, right? As you say, really what you end up getting instead are these new images, right? But nevertheless, the impulse to break free of images is there. Um, and so maybe the best thing I can say to, to, to wrap up a response to your question is how I, I hope that the book can try and help us see both sides of this, right? Both the, the desire to escape images and what's involved in that, whether it's in the case of these specific figures who are smashing the sculpture in the Mosul Museum or more generally just human, our human tendencies to desire this escape on the one hand, and the fact, as you say very rightly, that images, at least images of destruction can certainly play the form of tapping. You know, I just, um, uh, to add to um, Joshua's um, uh, uh, question, comment, um, and from what you just said, uh, you know, if you if you consider the relationship uh, between idolatry and iconoclasm as that between perhaps um, imminence and transcendence, um, two factors which are often found together and which are involved in 
often in some kind of struggle, you know, perhaps you see in ISIS, in the iconoclasm of ISIS, an effort uh, to attain a kind of absolute transcendence without any imminence at all. And as I take it, what your argument is uh, stating is not simply that that is an impossibility and you show that very nicely by how even the, the destruction of images can only occur by the creation of new images. Uh, but you go beyond that uh, paradox uh, to show that images are absolutely crucial for political life uh, because, and you marshal a whole host of really interesting evidence for this, including, and I would like to come back to this, Farabi, the famous um, uh, philosopher, Muslim philosopher, uh, on how uh, images make for consent of various kinds, that what would otherwise be a relationship of pure force, and therefore in that sense, not really political because it is not self-sustaining. Right. Um, uh, what the image does by, as it were, uh, uh, being constituting a kind of almost third party that makes for the agreement of others, that represents the agreement, uh, even if divided, uh, of parties A and B, you know, the image as the party C uh, that brings them together in this triangular fashion, uh, consent to and participation in politics only uh, uh, is achieved by way of the image. But doesn't that suggest that the effort of ISIS is therefore anti-political by definition, that you know, what we have here is not in fact political Islam, that term that we have come to hear so much about, but the opposite. Absolutely, I think I like that. Uh, it's it's anti-political Islam. Um, yeah, no, I, th I think that that's great. I, I, I suppose what, to add to that, right, is the, the intuition that as you, as you were just describing, and as I think, at least my reading of Al-Farabi, who, you know, how Al-Farabi helped me to understand, I, I'm not gonna claim that I got him right, but I can, I can claim what I've learned from him, right? That politics, that, that politics is therefore necessarily going to be imperfect, right? It's not going to be fully satisfying, right? And I think that there, I, I think that maybe at the heart of the book is this intuition that there's something deeply connected between the non-fully satisfyingness of politics, and yet I would say necessary if we want to actually live together, and especially if we want to live together without just resorting to force, right? On the one hand, and the necessarily partial or imperfect nature of all images, right? I think that's, and, and therefore in, in that sense, all images are going to be idols. They're always going to fall short of the truth. That doesn't mean we destroy them because, if, because then we would be left with nothing. We would be left in a situation that we couldn't live politically, but rather what we need to do is find some way to uh, live with that imperfection. Um, and in a sense, that's what the, the book is all about for me, right? How, how do we come to be able to live with this imperfection rather than, um, right, you know, try and smash it, try, try, try to escape it. It's well, really you know, interesting. I'll... Yes, go ahead, Josh. Uh, I was just going uh, to that you say, I mean, it is a book about learning to live with the imperfection of images, but as much it's a book about people who make images. And I guess just to come back to Faisal's distinction between this is an opposition between a sort of imminence in which one lives in images and a transcendence which seeks a life without images. Actually, the term that came to me when reading the book all the time was the medium term, which is fetishism, which is how does one create and curate a life with images? And both Erin wonderfully in your book, but also Faisal in, in your writing, you've looked at this urge of ISIS to live a life, I'm gonna quote, you know, on the surface, as it were, which attempts to dispense with any ambiguity. That seems to be a very true story about ISIS, but another story one could tell is they're great image makers. They're huge makers of images, right? And you detail some of those in the book. You, you, you look at the beer, you look at the videos. So I guess my question that isn't quite satisfied by your first answer is there's one opposition in the book, which is between the sort of the, the self-defeating urge to live a life without images and then how to live with the ambiguities of images. But then the question that remains for me is, well, which images? And which images should we make? 
because it seems to me there's a lot of disagreements in the book about the images that we live with and they're, they're disagreements between makers. So it was sort of an unfair question to pose to you, but sort of which are the images that we should live with if we want a politics which can deal with ambiguity and what are the sort of images that one might reject or right. even destroy? So I, a key question, right? And I, I'm not gonna be able to answer it satisfactorily. I try to deal with it a little bit towards the end of the book by at least suggesting two ways to, to get to that point where you can live with the ambiguity. And I suppose one of, so one of them is, I, I, I try to speak about images that are intentionally ambiguous, right? Rather than ones that try to hide the thing that they're, that the, that they're leaving out, but rather ones that try to, um, to get a, their audience to recognize that ambiguity and get them to think. And I think that, and I, I use, uh, for an example here, a photograph by, um, by the German photographer Struth um, of people looking at objects in the Pergamon Museum in, in Berlin. Um, and I think that there is something to, to explore down that line. But at the other hand, on, the, on the other hand, and I say this explicitly in the book, I don't think that you could actually build a regime of images that are ambiguous and constantly forcing kind of forcing people to be philosophical in that way. I think that um, I, one would have to think more about this, but I think at least one problem is that they, they will become, um, they'll lose their power, I think, very to do that very quickly. They, they'll become domesticated. And I think also that's probably not an actual life that um, any of us, even the most philosophical of us would ever be able to endure um, is another is another thing to think about, right? Um, and so the other is to try to cultivate a more sophisticated way of engaging with images such that you are attuned to trying to look for what they what they leave out to try and find their ambiguities, even if they're not even if the images themselves right are not trying to be ambiguous. Um, and that's in a way the kind of thing that I'm trying to, to cultivate with the book, right? The kind of, it's a kind of pedagogical move of how do we cultivate that in ourselves? Um, I'm, I'm a committed uh, teacher of the liberal arts and I believe that that's one of the things that the liberal arts and humanities can, can really instill in students. And so that's probably, there's a part of it that's connected to that. Um, but maybe the other thing to, to say, Joshua, is, I mean, in terms of how do you choose which images, right? I can't tell you which images to choose, but I can say that in order to do that, we need to cultivate judgment, the, uh, uh, the faculty of judgment. And I think that that's also a key part of the book, right? Trying to get us to recognize how there is no automatic way to um, get the right images. There's no way that would short circuit human involvement and human political political judgment in order to get the right images. And that's why in the, that's why I end the book in the end of the third chapter with a discussion of algorithms and social media. I mean, you talk about who, how, how do we choose the images? Well, Al-Farabi you know, gives us this picture of, of this ideal prophet who knows all and is able to choose the right images for the people, right? Well, I try to think about that and adapt it to our more democratic age and think, well, what, what would it mean for us as a democratic, as democratic regimes to choose our images for ourselves? And how does that work on Facebook or, or these other kinds of social media that we think of as incredibly dem democratizing on the one hand, where now we're all taking photos and posting them up, right? So we're taking these, we're taking these images, we're making these images and, 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 and we're circulating them. But on the other hand, um, that circulation is mediated by algorithms that are run by major corporations. So we have to think about that part on the one hand. And then the algorithm, uh, this is where I, I connected more to other themes in the book, this, this false notion that the algorithm is again, a kind of escape from the political, right? That we can, just like the Ahero Poetan of, of the middle ages, the, the work made without human hands, right? That, uh, that says, well, this is not an idol, it's an icon of Christ because it was made without human hands. Well, I think that the fetishization of, uh, maybe I don't wanna use that word, to, to, but our, the way that we think about the algorithm can 
can link up with that. Uh, and I think that we need to try and fight that tendency. I mean, in, in, but might we also argue, for instance, that what the kind of relationship ISIS is setting up is in one sense, a perverse vision of direct democracy insofar as they want pure dialogue. There is no image, right? Uh, you know, you just have uh, you and me uh, and the third, the they uh, is absent. Uh, and the they might serve as society or opinion to use a Farabian term yeah. or image or representation. Uh, uh, and that all must be destroyed. Uh, right. There is only you and me. Um, and in a way it, it, it allows us to think about how democracy in its non-direct form requires the image in the form of representation in both senses of that word, uh, not just someone representing you. Yeah. Representative democracy in the sense that an image is a representation. It surely cannot just be the individual voter. Right. The individual voters' views must be mediated through the representative who does something to them. Is not yeah. simply a transparency. Uh, yeah, this so makes are we me talking about two different ways of thinking about politics or of even democracy. Yeah. No, so, so this makes me think um, about one of the parts of the book that was the most fun for me to write, which is the part of the book where I talk about the significance of first. Uh, first person shooter video games, which had been recognized fairly early on as a kind of aesthetic model for ISIS videos and, and usually talked about as a means of, of a kind of recruitment technique. And, and as I say, I think that that was um, okay as far as it goes, but the more interesting thing what I was trying to do is actually to think about, well, what is actually at stake in terms of these questions, these political questions about wanting to live within a video game and how there is no politics within a video game, right? And there is no judgment within a video game, uh, right? And, and it's actually, in a sense, it's like just uh, the, what you're, what you're talking about Faisal just now, right? There's just the individual with the, with the rules of the, of the game moving through it, but there's no, uh, but, but there is no space for politics in a video game. And I think that that's precisely the vision that I'm trying to say, well, I think it's, it can be very, very seductive. And ISIS is certainly not the first to be seduced by, um, by, that, by that image of what human life can be. Uh, but I think it's also um, deeply problematic. And I think that it's like a kind of vision that we should try to hold at bay in order instead to cultivate the imperfect, uh, but yet in my opinion, better uh, capacity for living together politically. Thanks, including remark. I don't really have a last word. <laughs> um, I mean, I just, my only last word is I hope you enjoy the book and, and, and I hope you find it, you, you find it thought provoking. I certainly found it thought provoking and um, uh, I urge our audience to buy this book. It's published by the University of Chicago Press. Um, uh, it's a slim volume, but really packed with very interesting thoughts, all of which deal with Mesopotamia, uh, broadly speaking. Uh, and as an image in its own right to be found in museums, to be found in the streets of Mosul and to be found in our own works of analysis. Uh, so thank you very much, Aaron and Joshua uh, for this conversation. Thank you, Faisal. Thank you, Joshua. This is wonderful. Thank you both. Lovely talking to you.